Mr. President, members of the Institute of, for Cultural Diplomacy, ladies and gentlemen. First, I would like to thank Professor Mark Donfried for the kind invitation to deliver this speech in this wonderful city of Berlin. It is indeed an honor and a pleasure. On the wall of a subway station next to the campus of the University of Lisbon, in whose law school I studied, it is transcribed a well-known sentence by Socrates. I'm neither an Athenian nor a Greek, but a citizen of the world. I spent a few years of my life rereading it every time I passed by. Perhaps because this, uh, this almost daily encounter, I have internalized the message that it implies in some way, that of the universality of the human being, the openness to the world, the solidarity with others. If I had to choose a motto for my life, I would not hesitate. All those of you who studied or taught international law had to deal with the delicate problem which some call the juridical deficit. The expression is intending to refer to the fact that international law seems less law than domestic law and this less measures both availability as well as accuracy of the rules of international law. It is well understood why. Any introductory handbook on law theory explains that since courts are entities given the specific task of doing justice, that is, applying the law to the resolution of conflicts of interests, the performance of such a task requires two decisive conditions. Their ability to declare what the law is and how it is, their power to enforce the law applicable. The theory of the separation of powers, whether in the way of Locke or Montesquieu, turned during the 101 years between the English Bill of Rights and the Great French Revolution, the activity of establishing the applicable law into an autonomous function of the state, distinct from its other functions. However, unlike those others, namely the legislative function and the administrative function, it had a peculiarity. Its holders, the judges, lacked subjective legitimacy. In fact, they were not necessarily elected, even though in some countries they were, like the parliament deputies and the heads of the states of the republics. And they didn't hold any legitimacy based upon a, a dynasty like the sovereigns of the constitutional monarchies. The legitimacy of the judges and the courts then, as a rule, became grounded on the nature of their specific task by the way of A, their independent status, B, the noblest characteristic of their decisions, their impartiality, and C, the method to reach them, the adversarial proceedings. None of us will hesitate in challenging the nature of a court whose judges, appointed by the government, favor one of the parties or do not listen to the other party's reasons. This would be a fake court. In order to allow a court to fully perform its tasks, the legal order must guarantee four essential conditions. The citizen's ability granted by the Constitution to submit litigation to the court, the first one. A law sufficient and accurate stated by a legislative body or revealed by jurisprudence. Third, an authority superior to the litigants, generally accept, accepted and capable of imposing court's rulings against any will or power, even of the state itself. Last one, the availability of appropriate tools to guarantee such imposition. The international legal order faces troubles in meeting these standards. First, it is still although less and less a legal order of states. Citizens, as a rule, cannot seek solutions to their conflicts in most international courts, 
which are <coughs> exclusive to the states. The international concerns with human rights was raised uh, in the fundamental milestone of 1948, the year of the approval of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Further steps followed, namely the setting up of the courts in charge of the international protection of human rights and later the International Criminal Court, granting citizens access to international courts. Second, it is a dispersed, fluid and incomplete legal order, which bring, brings together stated sources, multilateral and bilateral international treaties and decisions of the international organizations, customary sources and jurisprudential sources, the de decisions of the international courts. The law is insufficient, inaccurate, and often inconsistent. Third, there is no superstate authority recognized as having undisputed authority to enforce international courts' decisions. The traditional idea of sovereignty made it inherent to the state and only to the state, rejecting thereby constraints on its performance. Finally, there are a few tools, if any, to enforce such decisions. In such a context, the effectiveness of the international law, namely the rules concerning human rights, and hence the court's decisions applying those rules, is highly dependent on, on the goodwill of the states. This, on the other hand, entails the verification of several conditions operating at the cultural, socio-economic and political legal levels. At the cultural level, it certain require, certainly requires the recognition that the culture of each of the groups to which, to which each of us belong, in my case, Portugal and Europe, has nothing intrinsically superior to any other. The differences which exist and would be absurd to deny do not allow cannot allow any ranking of cultures. In other words, tolerance to the other is cru crucial if that other belongs to a minority, ethnic, religious, political, or otherwise, is a fundamental demand. Unjustified prejudices based on such difference are a determining factor of discrimination. I stress that the, dif the difference itself is not the problem, not even its perception, but the belief that such a difference makes some human beings superior to, another's, to others. International law does not require everyone living on this planet to be equal. It does require that the differences between us do not become an anathema to some, turning them into inferior, if not subhuman beings. At the social economic level, it is indispensable that all human beings have the same possibilities, guaranteeing them a minimum quality of life standard, without which their personality cannot achieve full development. Lacking access to clean water, power supply, elementary health care, vaccination, for example, basic education makes such a minimum standard inaccessible. Without it, what val value does equality have? At the political level, the effectiveness of international law depends on several factors. First, the willingness of each state to accept that there are norms and principles of international law, which, given their significance to humanity, must always be respected. They provide the minimum normative body on which the very existence of international law depends. Therefore, they deserve the traditional Latin name of jus cogens, or mandatory rules. Second, each state must make the decision it deems appropriate for its development through loyal cooperation with our states, bilaterally or multilaterally giving up the imposition of unilateral solutions driven by its selfish interests. In the environmental field, for example, it is obvious that solutions to the problems affecting communities 
cannot be adopted and enforced unilaterally, given, given the consequences that such solutions have on other affected communities. More than that, with the increasing globalization, many important decisions of, of one state may affect others, be they neighbors, customers, or suppliers. This multilateralism works only when the most powerful states accept it in, in their international practice. In fact, international law is based on the principle that all states are equal before the law. However, this principle, extrapolated from the idea of equality among human beings, experiences practical obstacles. As Orwell wrote in his Animal Farm, all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others are. States too. The greatest difficulty that international courts have always faced is that of legit legitimacy. The domestic courts of each state, irrespective of the greater or lesser le legitimacy of the power of the state they belong to, enjoy, in general, an indisputable le legitimacy usually provided for the state constitutions where their power to decide disputes as is explicit grounds. We must add to this power the binding nature of their rulings, assured by tools appropriate to their enforcement whenever the addressees do not voluntarily respect them. International courts, on the other hand, live in a chaotic world where there is no recon recognized authority able to enforce their decisions. Therefore, the issues of legitimacy and le legitimation are crucial. If you add to this the features of the international legal order already mentioned, dispersion, fluidity, and incompleteness, we easily understand the enormous difficulties. It is in this world perhaps not as chaotic as Professor Ginsburg points out, but in any case, obscure and unstable that the international courts battle for legitimacy. The fi this fight is even harder due, due to the methods used for choosing the judges appointed to the international courts, usually conditioned in their appointment to a greater or lesser extent by state interference. In such, a world, in such a world, the effectiveness of court's decisions depends on their acceptance. This, in turn, depends on A, the independence shown by judges, B, their impartiality with regard to the interests of the states, C, the legal quality of their decisions, including the constancy of their jurisprudence as much as possible in line with previous decisions, D, the acceptance of their rulings by the legal communities of the states affected by them, and E, the respect for the procedural fairness principle in proceedings before the international courts. The doubts regarding the independence of the judges, which may always exist depending on the kind of state's intervention in their appointment, will be smaller the more stable their status is. The judges of the permanent international courts tend to be more independent or to be perceived as more independent than the judges of ad hoc arbitration courts, especially when their term of office has a pre-established duration. The impartiality of the judges in conflicts of interests engaging powerful states is an, an, uh, of an essential and absolute value as a conditio sine qua non for legitimizing their decisions. It is critical for the prestige of the court and the respe respectability of its rulings that such impartiality may not be challenged. The predictability of the, the decisions of any courts is priceless. A catalyst for legal, thirst, legal trust, as common law lawyers know best, and any inflections of its jurisprudence must be carefully justified. However, let us not be naive. 
regardless of such factors, the effectiveness of international court decisions also depends on the goodwill of states whose interests are called into question. Without this goodwill and in absence of coercive mechanisms, the state will not comply with the court's decisions. In other words, it depends on factors of a political nature. The goodwill of a state against whose interests an international court renders a ruling is conditioned by a waiting judgment. It is preferable to make such interests prevail and not to comply with the ruling, or, on the contrary, it's better to comply at the, co the cost of any injury, at the cost of an injury on its self-interest. The response of the state will depend on considerations of an essentially political nature, mainly the idea of reput reputational damage, the loss of credibility as a future, a future partner. At this point, we are in a position to analyze the growing threats to the international legal order, which weaken its already limited effectiveness and undermine its consolidation. These threats are unilateralism and nationalisms. If you take in a, into account the origins of the word unilateralism, it comes from the Latin word latus, which has several meanings, am among which the Portuguese words lado, side in English, and lato, broad in English. Literally, unilateral means that there is only one side. In English, the term exists the same, unilateral, unilateral, having as a more ordinary synonym the word one-sided. The Merriam-Webster dictionary, <laughs> which I quote, uh, teaches that the word means having only one side. Interestingly, the first explanation given in the dictionary is within the field of politics, stating that one side means, I quote, involving only one group or country. This political sense of the word becomes exclusive when one seeks unilateralism, which the same dictionary defines as, I quote again, a policy of taking unilateral action as in international affairs, regardless of outsider support or reciprocity. The sense is similar, though with an emphasis on power, to what is found in writings within the field of political science. Uh, Professor Ruth Wedgwood for instance, uh, writes that unilateralism is the term to describe the situation where the powerful state disrespects norms and adopts a self-centered foreign policy. Unilateralism suggests that something has only one relevant side. This side, our side, the right side. We annihilate the other side, their side, the wrong side. Accordingly, we protect our, protect our side against other irrelevant sides, raising customs duties, making tougher laws against immigration, even building walls. The other side, that, that, that after all exists, retaliates. Regulation by force replaces regulation by law. Both sides lose. Like Gandhi once said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth will leave us blind and toothless. Of course, the problems caused by unilateralism are not the result of every unilateral decision taken by state bodies. They have always taken and are still taking a multiplicity of unilateral decisions, which are of no concern to international law. Unilateralism raises major problems in two circumstances. Either the state reverses dominant multilateralism or bilateralism in fields where the decision of states most traditionally affect the interests of other states or their citizens, as in the field uh, of env environmental issues, as I told you before, or the state chooses unilateralism as a political instrument, triggering a widespread degradation of the search for consensus among states, disregarding the legitimate interests and expectations of other states, 
as it happens with the unilateral raise of trade tariffs driven by reasons exclusively arising from the interests of the state, what we call usually protectionism. Unilateralism, as bad as it is, it is not the only threat to a, an inter international community governed by the international law based on the search for equitable solutions to the problems affecting the world today, solutions based upon consensus and commitment. Another threat, no less serious, comes from the emergence and growth of nationalisms. Someone wise said that the ignorance about the past prevents us from understanding the present and shaping the future. I will add that the unfortunately accent of the ignorant awakes the sleeping ghosts. We must stress that the term nationalism does not necessarily have a negative connotation when used in the singular. It simply means, according to that same dictionary, loyalty or devotion to a nation. However, it can also carry a negative burden, meaning, uh, uh, still according to the same dictionary, the sense of national consciousness exalting one nation above all others. Used in the plur plural, it tends to appeal to a clash of nations, each claiming to be superior. When I was a young law student, just entering law school, in that year of all the rupture, ruptures and utopias of 1968, 50 years ago, I lived in a backyard, isolated, self-enclosed country built on past glories, true or fantasized. A trip to Paris or London required months of planning. Passport, military leave, exchange currency, currency permits, and the, and the advanced purchase of francs or pounds. An authoritarian, an authoritarian government prevented me from buying the books I want to read and forbid me to travel to the places I wanted to visit. Although, although there is a Portuguese word without precise translation in other, another language, they say, which designates this kind of mel melancholic reminder of what we once lived, the, the Portuguese word is saudade, is something that I do not feel for this past. Before was not so good, and today is, in spite of the problems, much better. This is why I become upset when accountable but deplorable European voices reject refugees because they are of a different color, religion, ideology, or simply they have no money. When they make their domestic interests prevail of all feelings of humanity, when they consider their citizens superior to the other human beings. The exacer exacerbated nationalisms and selfishness that pollute Europe contribute, along with unilateralism, to questioning the possibility of a world actually governed by the law. The alternative they offer is not a promising future, but a return to a painful and dangerous past. I will not take their poisonous offer. Thank you very much for your attention and patience. And, and so on, and the need to, to let the international law to have a, uh, a very important role. And, and, and it, it's a, a special relationship now between international law and uh, domestic law. So because, uh, but at the end, uh, the place of the, and the role of international law to the domestic legal order depends from the place and the role that the constitution of the state gives to international uh, international law, especially in the field of human rights. You touched it, very, very interesting. So, uh, 
I would like also to, to because theoretically, of course, it's excellent, and you presented it excellent, but how it is in, in, in Portugal, so uh, the, the place of international law, and especially relationship between the European Convention of Human Rights and, and, uh, and uh, domestic law, and how do you implement these standards? Because it's not uh, easy in some countries. I don't like to mention it's also a very developed democracy, but uh, there are mm -hmm. a lot of problems. Small countries are always interested to give a privileged place to Spain. Mm -hmm. But big countries uh, sometimes hesitate and to give how it is concrete okay. in, in the Portugal. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, I will tell you something. We don't have a general problem with the, the European Court of Human Rights or the European Convention. We have a very specific problem, which is our pathology. It's the way the courts, the, the, the slow taking of courts' decisions. The problems with the, with the, the European Court and the European Convention, 90% of them concern the delays on the justice. On the Portuguese justice suffers from that uh, sickness, a serious sickness. We try to improve a bit, but it is still a major problem. It's very common to have procedure proceedings for three years, four years, five years, six years. Uh, last week I know something about 14 years in a, in a, in a, 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 in a procedure con concerning an heritage, for instance. In civil procedures it is the worst. In, in procedure concerning, for instance, immigrants, we don't have a problem. We don't have a, any problem with, with, with the European Court. And I would say that our, our major problem is this one. We are very slow. And uh, for a court to decide slow, it's to be unfair. You know, there is no such a thing as slow justice. Or is justice, or there is no justice. Slow justice is injustice. <laughs>